through a glass darkly. This is a Sabbath school lesson for the first quarter of 2013, the principal contributor being uh, James Gibson from the uh, Geoscience Research Institute, its director currently. The editor of the Sabbath School lesson itself is um, uh, the Sabbath School Quarterly is uh, Clifford Goldstein. And uh, there are a number of other people who have worked on it. We've already been through six lessons. We are into the seventh one, which is through Glass Darkly. And there are still some more. Next week it will be Jesus Provider and Sustainer talking about the fact that um, the author of creation is still at work today. And uh, the memory text uh, that they're going to give is uh, 1 Corinthians 3.19. Uh, theirs is the New International Version. Again, I learned it in the Old King. The wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And a little later we'll see another version of that. The Sabbath School lesson begins up the afternoon by saying theologian William Paley wrote a book in 1802 entitled Natural Theology in which he argued that one can use observations of nature in order to develop an understanding of God's character. He wrote extensively on the ways in which the features of the animals exhibited the care and skill of the creator. Paley may have made too much of some features, however, because he failed to recognize the effects that both sin and the fall have had on nature. In fact, I would s simply say he did make too much. Uh, but his general argument has never been refuted, and I would agree with that, despite numerous and vociferous claims to the contrary, and hopefully we'll get into that just a little bit. Charles Darwin, in contrast, argued that a God who designed every feature of nature would not be good. As evidence, he referred to a parasite that feeds within the living bodies of caterpillars in the cruel way in which a cat will play with a mouse. For him, these were examples were evidence against the existence of a loving creator God. And they are, though I think he misunderstood the nature of that evidence. Though Paley was obviously closer to the truth than was Darwin, this week's lesson will examine what the Bible has to say regarding the question of what it is that nature reveals and does not reveal about God. Sunday's lesson, the earth is the Lord's. Scientists once challenged the need for God. He argued that he could create humanity just as well as any God could. God said, okay, go ahead and do it. Scientists began to gather some dirt, but God said, wait a minute, make your own dirt. Uh, though this story is only a fable, the point is clear. God is the only one who can create from nothing. God made all the material of the universe, including our world, our possessions, and our bodies. He is the legitimate owner of everything. Um, I think there's more to what God did than just simply make dirt, but... What's the most basic message to us in these texts? And more important, what does this message tell us about the way in which we should relate to the world, one another, and to God? And then they give the texts. And we're going to look at them very briefly. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. God made the world, he owns it. Who hath prevented me, that should be, who hath preceded me, that's the old English, that I should repay him. Whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine. I made the thing, I own it. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by my name, by thy name thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. I'm not sure why verse 2 was included in that, but verse 1 certainly says not only God created us, but he redeemed us. And then uh, 1 Corinthians what, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body 
and your spirit, which are God's. A favorite Christian hymn begins with the words, This is my Father's world. It truly is our Father's world because he created it. There is no more legitimate claim to ownership than creatorship. God created and therefore owns the entire universe, the heavens and the earth, and all that is in them. Not only does the world belong to God, he claims ownership of every creature on earth as well. No other being, at least that we know of, has the power to create life. God is the only creator, and as such, the ultimate owner of every creature. We are all completely dependent upon God for our existence. We cannot give God anything except our allegiance. Everything else on earth is his already. More so, we are not only gods by creation, but even more important, by redemption. Through a wonderful gift from God, human life has been, though a wonderful gift from God, human life has been greatly damaged through sin, and it will end in death, a prospect that denudes life of all meaning and purpose. Life as it ex now exists for us isn't all that great. Our only hope is the wonderful promise of redemption, the one thing that can make things right again. Thus we are Christ by creation and by redemption. A fallen world. One thing is certain, the world in which we now live is vastly different from the one that came forth from the Lord at the end of creation week. Certainly powerful evidence of beauty and design exists almost everywhere. However, we are sin-damaged beings living in and trying to understand a sin-damaged world. Even before the flood, the world had been negatively impacted by sin. As Ellen White said in Conflict and Courage, in the days of Noah, a double curse was resting upon the earth in consequence of Adam's transgression and of the murder committed by Cain. How was the world cursed, and what were the results of those curses? And the first one is Genesis 3.17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. And uh, then it talks about thorns and thistles, and I'm not sure why they cut off the verse at that point. And now this is Cain's curse, and thou th th art, cur art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tellest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And then finally, this is simply a description of the, of the work which had to be done uh, during the days of Noah. And he, shook, and he called his name Noah, saying, which is rest. This same shall comfort us concerning our work and, toil, and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. The curse in the ground for Adam's sake must have involved the plant kingdom because its results would include the production of thorns and thistles. The implication is that all of the creation is affected by the curses resulting from sin. The Ellen G. White quote above states very clearly that the curse upon Cain was not limited merely to him, but rested on the whole world. Unfortunately, the curses due to sin didn't end here, because the world faced another curse, which greatly damaged it. That, of course, was the worldwide flood. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. And that's Genesis 8.21. The flood disrupted the system of watering that God had established at creation. Our rain is not anywhere near as good. Stripping the soil from parts of the earth and depositing it in other parts. Even now, rain continues to leach the soil, robbing, of it, robbing it of its fertility and further reducing the crop yield. God graciously promised not to curse the earth again, but the soil we have inherited is a far cry from the rich, productive soil that God originally created. Read Romans 8, 20, 19 through 22. Though these are difficult verses, how do they relate to what we have studied today? More importantly, what inherited hope can we derive from them? And the relevant verses are talking about the earnest expectation of the creature which waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, 
uh, not willingly, but by reason of him who had subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we, now, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. So there is a promise that the entire world will be recreated in a better way. The ruler of this world, and this is interesting, Job 1, 7, the Lord said unto Satan, Whence cometh thou? And then Satan answered the Lord, and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And for, for anybody from uh, the Middle East of that time would recognize that this is what a king does in his kingdom. He goes where he wants to. He looks at what he wants to. Wherever he's walking, that's his territory. And then uh, the New Testament, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. As we have seen, the world belongs to God, both by creation and by redemption. But we mustn't forget either the reality of Satan, the reality of the great controversy, and the reality of Satan's attempt to wrest control over all that he possibly can. Even though the cross made his defeat certain, he's not going down quietly or gently. I'm not sure what that first comma is doing in that sentence. Um, <clears throat> his wrath and destructive power, though limited to a degree by God in ways that we certainly don't understand now, must never be underestimated. We mustn't forget either that however often issues may come down to us in shades of gray, the ultimate battle boils down to only two forces, Christ and Satan. There is no middle ground. And as we know, so much of this world falls under the banner of the wrong side. Is it any wonder then that the world is so damaged? I read John 12, 31, 14, 30, 16, 11, Ephesians 2, 2, and 6, 12, and all of these are texts that talk about the reality and uh, to a certain extent the power of the evil one. Now is the judgment of this world, now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Here, hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. The prince of this world, the prince of this world is judged. And then moving on to uh, Ephesians, uh, wherein in time past we walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And, of course, Ephesians 6.12, uh, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is not just an academic discussion. There, there are eternal consequences and eternal and uh, almost eternal forces involved. In the book of Job, some of the veil that hides the reality of the great controversy is pulled back, and we can see that Satan does have the ability to cause great destruction in the natural world. Whatever the phrase the prince of this world entails, it is clear that in this role Satan still exerts a powerful and destructive influence on the earth. This truth gives us all the more reason to realize that the natural world has been greatly damaged, and we need to be very careful about the lessons that we draw from it regarding God. After all, Look how badly Darwin misinterpreted the state of the world. In what ways can you see clearly the destructive influence of Satan in your own life? And why is the cross and the promises found in it your hope? That's left as a question to be pondered. The wisdom of the world, as humans, we've gained an incredible amount of knowledge and information, especially in the last 200 years. Knowledge and information, however, are not necessarily the same thing as wisdom. We have also gained a much greater understanding of the natural world than our forefathers ever had. A greater understanding, however, isn't the same as wisdom either. I uh, read 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 21, and 3, 18 through 21, and question is asked, how do we see the powerful truths of these worlds manifested in our time and context today, almost 2,000 years after they were written?
So the first passage, 1 Corinthians 1, or pardon me, 2 Corinthians 1. I mean, uh, 1 Corinthians 1. But the pre preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. That's, of course, quoting Proverbs. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God make foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in wisdom of God, by wisdom, for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And uh, then three, the same verses. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. And then our memory verse is there. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. So this is a consistent message with the Old Testament. Let, uh, therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. There is so much in human thought that challenges God's word, whether the issue is the resurrection of Jesus, the creation itself, or any miracle. Human wisdom, even when buttressed with the facts of science, must be deemed foolishness when it contradicts the word of God. Also, as stated earlier, so much science today, especially in context of human origins, begins from a purely naturalistic perspective. Even though many of history's greatest scientific geniuses, Newton, Kepler, Galileo, were believers in God, might add Faraday and Maxwell to that, um, and saw their work as helping to explain the work of God in creation, Kepler once wrote, O God, I think thy thoughts after thee, such sentiments today are often mocked by segments of the scientific community. Some even seek to explain away the miraculous stories in the Bible by arguing that they were really naturally occurring phenomena that the ancients, ignorant of nature's laws, misinterpreted as divine action. There are, for, for instance, all sorts of naturalist theories that seek to explain the parting of the Red Sea as something other than a miracle of God. A few years ago, one scientist speculated that Moses was on drugs, and so he just hallucinated the idea that God gave him the Ten Commandments on tablets of stone. However silly some of this might sound, once you reject the idea of God and the supernatural, you need to come up with some other explanation for these things, hence the foolishness that Paul so clearly and prophetically wrote about. Through the eye of faith, Psalm 8 is one of the best loves of the Psalms, to David, as a believer in God, the creation spoke of the Lord's majesty and of love. What specific lessons did David see in the creation is recorded in Psalm 8. Also considering what we know about the creation today, the moon and the stars and so forth, in contrast to what was known back then, why should David's words seem even all the more remarkable? I'm not sure that that latter actually follows for reasons which I'll explain in a bit. Of course, Psalm 8 is, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens, and then continuing on. A familiar psalm to most of you. Um, that God made man to have dominion over the works of his hands and everything, and then it lists them. And then, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. And then the commentary is, only in the last 100 years have we really come to begin to grasp the vastness of the cosmos and hence our physical smallness in comparison. One can't even imagine someone like David, apart from divine revelation, having any idea of just how big the heavens were. If he was in awe back then, how much more should we be knowing that, despite the size of the universe, God loves us with a love that we can't even begin to fathom? Um, there's actually people, not in David's day specifically, but certainly in before the time of Christ, who wrote that as far as the earth and the sun and everything else where it is concerned, 
the stars were so far away that for mathematical purposes we could be considered a point. That's another way of saying for practical purposes they're infinite. Now the interesting thing is you have to contrast their idea with, of, of time and space with ours. Today, if I decide to go anywhere in the world, I can be there by tomorrow at this time. I might have to spend a lot of money to get there. Well, I suppose, you know, to climb Mount Everest, you probably have to climb it and a few things like that. Although, if, I suppose if you wanted to, you could charter a helicopter or something. Um, but, I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, you name any place where people live, you can get there. That wasn't the case back in David's day. In David's day, a day's journey was maybe 25 miles. And yeah, you could get faster if you ran. The original marathon was 22 miles, and the legend has it that the guy who ran it dropped dead at the end. It's not clear whether he actually did or not, but certainly he was pretty well exhausted to get, to get there. Nowadays, we think nothing of going 3,000 miles in five hours. So when they look up at the heavens and they think they're a long ways away, they're further away, they're so far away that for mathematical purposes they can be considered a point. I'm not sure that our universe is any bigger to us than theirs was to them. I think that's a... a a culture-centric way of looking at the, at the uh, size of the universe that's probably not appropriate, although it's very common. Read Psalm 19, 1 through 4. This is an old familiar passage. What did David see in the heavens? And of course, he saw the glory of God. And uh, I won't uh, bother to read that whole passage. Many have looked up at the stars at night and recognized the greatness of God and the smallness of humanity and have praised God for his care. Others have focused on the problem of evil in nature and blamed God for the problems that are, in fact, the result of their own choices or of the devil's activities. To the believer, the creation truly speaks of God's care, even amid the evil introduced by Satan. Yet, even as powerful as of a testimony and witness that the created world is the revelation, is incomplete, especially due to the results of the fall and the curses it has brought. I would agree with that. Uh, reading John 14, 9, think of Jesus on the cross. Why must the cross always be the main revelation test of the nature and character of God? And the reason for that is because, as Jesus said to Philip, have, you been so long time, have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He has seen me, has seen the Father. And how sayest then? Now then, show us the Father. And the idea is that when Jesus went through the cross, that gave us an idea of what God was like, in fact. And then finally, we're in Friday's lesson, further study. I've been warned, in 1890 this is, that henceforth we shall have a constant contest. Science, so-called, and religion will be placed in opposition to each other because finite men do not comprehend the power and greatness of God. These words of Holy Writ were presented to me. Of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Now, turning to the book that was written as a companion to the lesson, uh, just a few things that uh, came out in the book that were not as obvious as they were in the lesson that he mentions the double meaning of the serpent's curse, that it was cursing the serpent, but also cursing the devil behind the serpent. The devil would finally lose. He, the curse that was produced, uh, pronounced was upon all animals. We don't see animals in their original form, which means the people who judge lions as obligate meat eaters are not judging the original creation. Uh, he mentions design arguments 
and uh, I expands on them a little bit more. He talks about the problem of natural evil, and he makes two comments. One of them is that some natural evil can, in fact, be redemptive, although I think that's rather God taking the devil's works and turning them in on him, and uh, that the devil can partially control nature. You will remember in the story of the book of Job, uh, where fire came down from heaven and consumed part of Job's uh, substance, and where a tornado or a whirlwind uh, came out of the desert and took care of some more of Job's riches. And uh, uh, that means that at least at, when God gives the devil permission, uh, the devil actually can control parts of nature. God can be in a thunderstorm or in the raging of uh, the raging of the sea, so God can be seen in forces of nature that we ordinarily would consider to be bad. The unbeliever can see evidence for, as Paul puts it, his eternal power and Godhead. And then he makes a point which I think is important, and that is that love is the strongest evidence for God. And I think that's an important point if we ever enter into a debate to keep in mind that if in the middle of the debate we lose our love, we have lost the most powerful evidence for God. It is better to love and not argue than it is to argue and not love. And then finally he says the blessing God pronounced on the original creation has been overprinted by curses on the plants, the animals, and the land itself. And that leads to an important point that I want to make, I think. And uh, then I'm going to read the uh, challenge questions and then let you guys take it over. Uh, the stance of this lesson can be and has been at times criticized as being obscurantist in the face of overwhelming evidence. So you just, you know, you don't have an answer, so you say, well, um, we're seeing through glass darkly. I think the criticism is misguided, and I think in an important sense, it's obscurantist itself, and I, I'll explain that now. Basically, the position of the lesson is that nature is more complex than a simple God's in his heaven, all's right with the world, which was popular in the Victorian era of, uh, of Paley. And in fact, that was Paley's position that the lice were given to help us to make sure that we kept our bodies clean. And I think it was wrong. You see, Paley, everything had to be created by a good God, and that means that the stuff that we would think of as evil also had to be created by a good God. And Darwin's criticism of the wasp that feeds on the living body of its caterpillar and his criticism of a cat which catches a mouse and then plays with it, allowing the mouse to become more and more terrified until finally the cat decides it wants dinner and kills it. That those are legitimate criticisms of Paley's position. Paley didn't take evil seriously enough. Now, Darwinists loved to fight Paley because he was susceptible to that kind of argument. You see, every time that the design argument is trotted out, the argument from evil is trotted out to match it. And as long as you have a good God that's in total control of the universe, including the free beings, which aren't really free because they're controlled by God too, as long as you're trying to defend that, you're susceptible to that argument. But in fact, our position does not argue that way. Our position is God is interested in having creatures that he can have actual communication with. He has created them and he has given them free will so that they can choose to love him. But in the process of being able to can choose to love him, they can also choose not to and they can create a great deal of destruction. Our position is therefore 
not that of Paley. And in fact, it's because of that it's not susceptible to those particular anti-Paley arguments, which have always worked for these people in the past. And so they think we're trying to somehow escape from it. That's tough. In fact, our position is the right one, or is as close to the right one as we can get with our knowledge. In fact, there are gaps on all sides, but certainly our position has gaps, but so does their position, the Darwinist one. Radiometric dating is a problem for us. The origin of life is a problem for them. Frankly, of the two, I'd rather have our problems than theirs. One key part of radiometric dating, I think carbon-14 dating, has turned around and is now biting them instead of us. There are other hints as to how other radiometric dating arguments might be answered. They have no clue on the origin of life, and they know it. In fact, beyond the fact that on the evidence I think we're winning, there's something fundamentally bizarre about their position. They're using assumptions that the universe is rational everywhere and that we can understand that rationality. There are laws of nature, they're simple, they're everywhere obeyed. To argue that there's no fundamental rationality to the universe. Think about that. On the other hand, we can at least argue that the laws of nature argue for a rational lawgiver. I think in, in the end, ours is the more rational and theirs is the less rational position. And that's why I say I think their argument is fundamentally misguided. Now, I'm going to throw out the questions and then you can respond to whichever ones you want to. Number one, think about the threefold curse on this earth, the cursing resulting from Adam's fall, from Cain's sin, and from the flood. The cumulative effect of these curses, compounded over thousands of years, means that our present world is much different from the way that it was when God first created it. Why then must we be careful regarding the conclusions that we draw from the present world about what it was like in the beginning? I don't know. To me, that almost sounds like a rhetorical question once you phrase it that way. Uh, think about the work that science does, especially in the area orig of origins. There are no written labels to explain what we see. Science is entirely a human undertaking, and the human mind is limited in its scope and is pr prone to resist divine authority. Furthermore, Satan's influence is strongly felt in nature, so that much of what we see is incompatible with God's self-revelation in the Bible. Why is it so important that we create, place greater confidence in Scripture than we do in science, especially when considering unique events such as the creation of our world? That feeds into the comments that I was making. <clears throat> we do not understand all aspects of the tension between scriptures and science, but God is far wiser than we are, and we must acknowledge that there is more to the creation than science can ever discover. Why should we, in fact, not be surprised to find some tension between the supernatural events recorded in the Bible and the materialistic approach of science? Again, that's almost rhetorical. Look at the Ellen White quote above that we read about. Uh, how our denomination in particular is going to have to deal with this. In what ways are we seeing this b being fulfilled in our own church? Uh, Any more, that's almost sounding <laughs> rhetorical. Um, how can we deal with these dangerous change challenges to our mission and message in a way that, while never compromising our position on creation in the Word of God, still keeps the church a safe place for those who are struggling with these difficult questions? And I think that that is a question that's very much worthy of discussion. And finally, 
Read Romans 11, 33 through 36, and Job 41, 2, 7, and 8. And the question that's asked is, how reliable is human wisdom while attempting to understand the ways of God? What should be our attitude towards the difficulties that we encounter when trying to find harmony between science and scripture? And those are the questions. Uh, if you have other ones that are related, you're welcome to bring them up instead or in addition. And uh, at this time, we'll open the floor for discussion. Just kind of an observation about William Paley. Uh, he a th was a theologian, but he did he ever study his Bible? I, I just can't imagine that he really <laughs> studied and understood the scriptures that well, because he would not have c come to the conclusions he did you mean to be ridiculed. William Paley? Yeah. yeah. It's just, it boggles the mind. Well, there was a very strong cultural prejudice at that time yeah. that, um, that uh, it partly came from Calvinist theology because God made the world exactly the way it was supposed to be, and including the devil. And then when the devil started fading off, God took over everything. And after all, since the devil was made by God, and made his choice the way God wanted him to, then God controls everything. So you just, you have to bow before God and, uh, and say, you know, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord. That was, that was where you were stuck. And I think Job was stuck there, and I think, frankly, the whole book of Job is a commentary on why evil happens and uh, and does it happen to good people yes yeah you made reference to uh, to uh, radiometric uh, dating and carbo 14 I was reading this week a report a scientific report of uh, carbon 14 dating of dinosaur bones Yes. And the, the, there was given an example of, uh, I think, at least half a dozen bones for dinosaurs. And the, they submitted this to a regular scientific laboratory. And they did a carbon-14 testing. And the, it showed the, an age between 29,000 and 39,000 years. Now, that's a discrepancy, a huge discrepancy between... 65 million years. Uh, what, what is your thought about that? Well, um, we've covered that somewhat in class before. Uh, that carbon-14 is in very old material all over the place. Uh, in fact, they're finding more than, than we've been finding because ours, uh, uh, ours has been about 0.03% modern carbon on the average. And there's this 0 0.04, and I think there was one that was about 4%. I'd have to look it up to be sure. But it's a significant amount of, of carbon-14. Um, I suspect that the ancient world was not completely homogenous in terms of its carbon-14. And so you did have areas that had more and, uh, and less carbon-14. That's partly because, according to what we understand from the, the biblical references, um, you didn't have rain, and therefore you wouldn't have thunderstorms, you wouldn't have violent winds, you wouldn't have a lot of other things that, that pretty much require rain, and which meant that the climate, the, the air didn't move very much, and that meant that carbon-14 could build up where it was made instead of getting mixed thoroughly all around the world. Uh, the mixing right now is so efficient that when we doubled the concentration of um, carbon-14 in the northern hemisphere by doing nuclear tests outside uh, where the neutrons could run into nitrogen-14 and produce a lot of carbon-14, that that carbon-14 got distributed pretty evenly around the entire atmosphere within about 10 years. 
But if you don't have those kinds of winds, then you have a lot more carbon-14 in some areas and not in others because right now, carbon-14 is not made around the whole wor world at the same rate. And in fact, there's some differences that you can show between summer and winter, for example, as to how much carbon-14 is in various, uh, uh, various plants that are grown. And it makes a difference in how you, for example, date the pharaohs. <coughs> So uh, it's a little bit of a complex subject. The, the main point is, though, that if this stuff hasn't been replaced, and it doesn't look like it has, then it's not millions of years old. It's that simple. Yes? I just might add, I, th I think when we get to the aquatic world, the discrepancies are much greater than we have in the uh, gaseous world, what I call the atmosphere. Uh, ocean organisms all date older than living ones. Than Meaning they don't have as much carbon-14. Right. And um, Nevada, you can pick up some shells there in some of the lakes where they've got old carbonate in the lakes. They'll date 26,000 years. Uh, this is living organisms and, and so on. And you picked them up yesterday. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, so uh, you, uh, in the aquatic world, the discrepancy is, is much greater. Uh, it's, it's true that there are good explanations for this to a certain extent, but l let's face it, what it's saying is that mixing is not good, which is the point you're making. Well, yeah, mixing today in the atmosphere is good, but mixing back then in the atmosphere may not have been as good. Uh, but beyond that, there's another interesting that's even more important than the actual numbers that we're getting and what they mean. And that is that evidence for this presentation was deliberately scrubbed from the American Geophysical Union meetings uh, uh, publications. Uh, the, the talk disappeared down the memory hole. Um, I'd say this is remarkable, except that I have personally run into this myself. I presented a paper arguing that we needed a carbon-14 date of a scroll of Leviticus from the, one of the caves in Qumran. Um, first of all, when they had the papers, our section was the only section that didn't have uh, abstracts of the papers being presented. I still have the announcements. And secondly, uh, uh, it, it proved impossible to be able to publish the, uh, uh, the paper after it had been presented which is interesting. Uh, even Herschel Shanks didn't want to touch it, so. Yes? Is it really futile to harmonize science with religion? Is it really? Futile. And if it is, why? I think that depends on how you define science. Well, science is, science is defined now, I mean, idealistically. Um, idealistically, I don't think it's, it's futile. But if it's defined realistically as the current scientific consensus, I think that some of those positions were designed not to be compatible with religion. And therefore, trying to fix, trying to fit religion with those uh, is uh, simply impossible. Not, not so much a conspiracy as a living out of people's views of, of what happened. You see, if you start out with the knowledge that material, the material world is all there is, 
that what the Bible describes as miracles simply can't happen and therefore didn't. There must be some other explanation for them. Then if they really did happen, you cannot fit them into that kind of science. It was deliberately designed not to be able to fit them into it. Um, if, if you have no room for God who can interact with matter, then you develop all kinds of theories around that. Then if there is a God who in fact does interact with matter, your theories are, are designed not to be compatible with that. And it's no big surprise that they don't fit. On the other hand, if you, design, if you define science as the search for knowledge, the search for truth, no holds barred, In the physical world, you see, the assumption that is made, and this is where you have to be careful about that, is that matter will behave the way matter characteristically behaves at all times. And let me give you an example that uh, C.S. Lewis gave you. Supposing that I take a drawer and I put in two cents. And I shut it up. I come back later. I put in five cents more. I shut it up. I come back later. I open the drawer. How much money is in the drawer? Seven cents. As long as nobody has monkeyed with it in the meantime. Nobody has added money. Nobody has taken away money. Nobody has changed them into quarters instead of pennies. Now, if somebody does go into the drawer and puts 14 more cents in, so now I have 21 instead of 7, have they violated the laws of physics? Yes. Yeah. Uh, at least um, to me, and I think uh, many others, uh, the separation of religion and science is uh, not necessary if you have a unifying goal, and that is that of uh, finding what is true. Uh, Science tends to isolate itself into materialism, uh, and in doing so, it excludes uh, certain areas, and this uh, aborts its claim to truth. Uh, because what if there is something beyond materialism? And we all think there is. Uh, at least most people think there, that there is something beyond this. Uh, so I, I think if you have a unifying principle, and uh, Gould's uh, book, you know, Two Magisteria, trying to separate uh, religion from science and so on. Uh, this is not interesting if you're looking for truth. You've got to have as broad an approach as uh, possible. You're much more likely to find truth if you look at more possibilities. And uh, I, I find that you know, if, if you make truth the goal, uh, science is interesting, but it's certainly no way to arrive at truth unless it'll open its doors to other possibilities beyond its materialism. Uh, uh, can I have a follow-up question? Sure. I, uh, I do understand that, uh, you know, if you take some animals uh, in water 
and they test 27,000 years or so, I can understand that, you know, that then 27,000 years or 39,000 years, if we get that age for, uh, uh, you know, the dinosaurs, uh, I, I can understand that, uh, uh, that that falls within reason for accepting our view of creation mm -hmm. within a reasonable amount, number, thousands of years, let's say 10,000, 7,000, whatever. My, my, I'm still puzzled, puzzled about the discrepancy between 30,000 years for those dinosaur bones and 65 million years. That's a discrepancy so huge that I don't have any way of uh, explaining this. Uh, do you? The short answer is no. Uh, the only way you can explain it, uh, that's way beyond laboratory contamination, and everybody knows it. Uh, the only way you could explain it is it got contaminated as it was in the ground by modern carbon coming in, in which case you have to assume that approximately 4% of some of the uh, um, content that has more radioactivity in it is exchanged at least within the last uh, 6,000 years which means that if it's been around for 65 million years, the exchange rate has to be so great as to have completely replaced it by then, in which case you cannot be looking at original bone, or original organic material inside the bone. You just simply cannot. That's one explanation. The other explanation is there was some kind of huge neutron burst that changed a lot of the nitrogen-14 into carbon-14. And that neutron burst would have had to have happened within the last 6,000 years as well. I mean, if you do 12,000 years, it has to be twice as big. If you do 18,000 years, it has to be four times as big. If you do 24, I mean, at a certain point, it becomes mathematically impossible. It didn't happen 45 million years ago, for example. Those are the only two options you have available, and the amount of exchange has to be so great that nobody really is willing to buy it. So basically, people who have that are now left with the equivalent of an origin of life problem or the equivalent of a, uh, of a radiometric dating in the opposite way problem. That is to say, they don't have an explanation. And I think that's why you saw that particular paper disappear. Is because they don't want to deal with that data. <laughs> if you had a neutron burst, though, uh, this pardon would, me. If you had a neutron burst, this would contaminate everything. I, it was. A th how come we got some older dates than that? Uh, well, the uh, the other question is, where did the neutron burst come from? Uh, Bob, uh, we have a, yeah, we have a mic here. Oh, uh, well, while they're waiting, do they, what molecules do they, or what did they test in the bone? Uh, they what? What, what? what organic molecule did they test in the bone? Uh, um, they tested, they tested humic acid and what they thought was protein. Mm -hmm. um, you know, which is pretty good. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating story. Uh, by the way, they're, they're a Catholic creationist organization. Think about that. Yes. Well, there's the other thing. I'm sure you're, I'm just reminding you all of the article, I believe it was printed in 2003 by Mary Schweitzer in Nature, which found intermedullary tissue in the femur of a female T-Rex, okay? And she was defrocked, almost defrocked, and um, she was certainly taken to the woodshed. 
Well, I just read uh, in Nature in the last uh, three or four months where three other labs have confirmed that that is in fact intermedullary tissue. Now the question is, for those who are acquainted with DNA and how quickly it mm -hmm. will break down, tell me how it's going to survive 65 million years in an animal that's been exposed enough for them to have, uh, in Montana, to have extracted the, it was, the femur was actually partially out, hanging out of this cliff and they had to go in and, and, and extract it and that's why they ended up cutting the femur off. They couldn't save the entire skeleton. It was impossible so they, they, they had to, it actually, in half they had and to cut it, it out to get it out. Pieces. Right. Yeah. So, um, there is no way of entombment. There is no way of cryptically um, com uh, have, having put that animal in an absolute airtight tomb that the DNA would survive 65 million years when it is so fragile. And, and that, that the, so, and the, the There's some debate as to whether they've actually gotten DNA out of it. Uh, it's partly fueled by this very controversy, I'm sure. Well, the point was the, the author at the end who was commenting on the fact that it's been now substantiated in three labs said we need to relook at how DNA can be preserved, not the fact that this is absolutely contradicts everything that we know about DNA and, and its ability to survive. Uh, the, I mean, that, having DNA survive is almost as remarkable as having carbon-14 survive. Well, you, you want to add the protein to that. Pardon me? You want to add the protein molecule to that also. Well, yeah, the protein molecules don't survive either. That's true. They survive a little longer than DNA, but you, you still have the same problem. Uh, right now, there's some stuff coming out of... Um, uh, I'm trying to think of... Uh, it's it's uh, up north somewhere in the... It may be Ellesmere Island, uh, but uh, among other people, um, Lee Spencer's working on it, and I guess that uh, 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 Arthur Chadwick has gotten involved in it now, and we're, uh, he's asked me to see if I can do some radiocarbon dating on it, so we'll probably have some more data on trees that have, you know, just s sitting out there in the... Uh, or buried in the uh, permafrost in the area. So it's going to be an interesting time. Uh, that's why I say I'm much more comfortable with our position than I am with theirs. And one more thought. I, I have an article that I have extracted. It was the last six months from Nature, and I haven't read it yet. It's in my to-read pile. I just scanned it, and I'm hoping someone else maybe read it. And it had to do with uh, correlating... Um, the activity on the surface of the sun, um, storms, etc., with changing the rate of decay of cesium. It actually um, found, was found to re slow it. It's very, very small. And, it's been, and it was recorded. And I, like I said, I wanted to read it. I haven't read it, so I'm, I'm really afraid to pontificate further. But this was, to me, a huge. Uh, change because radiometric dating is considered the gold standard, never changes, never can, never will. It's written in stone, pun intended. Um, and they, f they were using a neutrino, they were postulating some interesting things and the conclusion was, well maybe uh, radiometric dating isn't quite as, it, it, it is subject to external environmental changes. Yeah. So if, if that is true, I was hoping someone had read this, then we now can, can assail the radiometric dating as being unassailable. No, it's not. There well, is, if, if, if there's room for a small change, then one could argue that we have yet to discover other environmental factors which could cause a larger change. There was... I know that there was one article that came out, it was kind of the original one. I'm not aware of the cesium one, uh, but there was a manganese one that came out by Fishback and uh, I'm trying to think of who the other guy's name was, um, that noted manganese 
<clears throat> decaying more rapidly, and it preceded by a day or two the uh, solar flare that headed our way. And uh, their theory was that maybe this was the original neutrino burst that heralded the disturbance inside the sun that finally erupted as a solar flare in the next day or so. Uh, it's a good theory. We don't have a lot of evidence for it. Um, I guess one of the things that would be worthwhile doing is to see whether some of our neutrino detectors uh, found any extra neutrinos heading our way during that time. Um, I'm not aware that they've been able to show anything like that. So the specific mechanism, I think, is still open to discussion. Uh, what's not open to discussion is the idea that radiometric decay has been shown to be, at least in certain specific instances, non-random. Now, it doesn't get anywhere near enough to be able to explain away lead, lead dates, so uranium, lead, or, um, or rubidium strontium, or neodymium samarium, the various major kinds of datings, potassium argon. Uh, but it does raise some important questions. And one of the questions that I think it raises that's really important is, I participated in, this was 1992, was it, in Glacier View? Or two, 2002. 2002. Uh, in a discussion, and they had people on both sides of a particular subject presenting papers pretty much evenly. Uh, and the paper that was presented that I was supposed to respond to and that he was supposed to respond to mine never responded to mine, but basically went into saying that radiometric dating was something that depended upon something in the universe that if it changed for a little tiny bit, the whole universe would fall apart. And so it not only was constant, but it had to be. I think at this point we can say that that particular argument is dead, completely dead. Um, we may not have all the answers, but I think that at least as far as that part is concerned, uh, radiometric dating is not a fundamental part of the universe. Um, yes. Uh, you read the quotation from Ellen G. White where she said, from among yourselves shall arise, etc., etc. Now, my question is, uh, there is a La Sierra University, what has taken place lately in La Sierra University is all over now. It's in the public domain. LifeSite News has picked the story and all Adventist uh, publications, including Spectrum and Adventist Today. So, uh, do you think LNG White uh, was think, uh, or, or can we apply LNG White's quote to what has taken place in last year? Well, there was, there was something, somebody that made a really good observation that I think has, uh, that deserves a wider uh, comment. I think his name is Osborne. But uh, the observation that he made is this. There are two mutually incompatible defenses of what's going on at La Sierra. Number one is, we're teaching the same things that you guys are. We're really not doing anything different. And number two is, they need to teach evolution as a fact because, in fact, it's true. Now, 
one of those could be right, but both of them can't be right. It's a little bit like the lawyer who argues, I'm not responsible, my client is not responsible for that vase. First of all, he never borrowed it. Secondly, when he borrowed it, it was already broken. Thirdly, when he returned it, it was intact. Now, there is a kind of logic behind that way of arguing. But it is the logic of I'm defending somebody, not the logic of we're trying to find the truth. And I, I think that when people start using that logic, I'm deeply suspicious that they have gone from being scientists to being lawyers. Can I uh, mention an anecdote? I was probably, I don't know, five or six years old in a I decided to play with, uh, I think it was an aluminum uh, kitchen device, and I smashed it. And of course, my mother was upset, and uh, she asked me. I said, I didn't do it. And then my sister came and says, I saw you doing it. And I said, no. This is impossible because you were not present when I did it. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> now, I, I think that this is important. I, I think one other thing, though, that needs to be said about the La Sierra experience. Uh, number one, be careful about blackening everybody. Uh, first of all, be careful about blackening people in general. It's a matter of you know, stating what you know of the facts and then, and then letting, that, letting that be good enough. I, I think that uh, when we start trying to blacken people, we're already in really dangerous ground, if not uh, wrong ground. But the second thing is, uh, I mean, there are some people there, and I can name a few of them, although I probably won't because, uh, right here, because I might get them into more trouble but uh, who, in fact, are faithful to not only the rest of the Adventist message, but to the creation account as well. Um, so be careful about trying to make La Sierra it. The second thing is that we have the same problem to a either lesser or less famous degree in a number of our other colleges. Um, I can say that the general feeling at, for example, Southwestern and Southern is probably pretty solid. Uh, but I would say that one needs to be careful even in other institutions because there are some other ones where the uh, the same general beliefs are being held. It's just not as open and as uh, obvious. And um, and so, while we are dealing with the La Sierra problem, I want you to keep in mind that it is not the La Sierra problem, really. It is a general problem that is more obvious at La Sierra. Uh, I, I would, in this discussion that's been taken on uh, in the last couple of days, so on, but the issue of academic freedom has come up a little bit uh, about La Sierra and so on. And I, I just, uh, to me, this this is a, a simplistic argument that needs better evaluation and so on. Uh, you push academic freedom 
uh, to its limits, you can come to no conclusions whatsoever. Otherwise, you're not academically free. As soon as you draw a conclusion, uh, then your, your horizon is not as open as it is if you have refused to draw any conclusions. Well, if you can't draw any conclusions, what's the purpose of any study? Or, or I mean, what, what is our purpose for existence and life and so on if we can't draw some conclusions and act on those? Uh, our lives should be de dedicated to helping God save as many people as possible and so on. We want to evaluate our truths. We want to examine them uh, at all times in, in reference to new information. We must do that and so on. If you devote your whole life to doing that, you're not going to have much time uh, to doing that which is more important, and that is acting on the basis of the truth of what you think is truth. Uh, your, your life will be much more meaningful if you move in that direction. Well, my actual my response is is not to attack it from an academic freedom point of view. Uh, my response is to say. They want academic freedom, they can have academic freedom. There's only two things that I ask. Number one is they make clear to the kids who are going there and to the parents of those kids what they believe. So that uh, people have the opportunity, if that's not the education they want their kids to get, or that's not the education they want to get if they're kids, that they have the, a reasonable opportunity to avoid it. And number two is that they make that clear to the funding agencies, including the Adventist Church. And if they want to go that way, and the Adventist Church doesn't feel that it's appropriate to fund them, that. Uh, then the Adventist Church can make an appropriate decision based on their decision as to what they want to do. If they want academic freedom, they can have it. But they need honesty. See? And by the way, that is my answer to what you do f about people who need a, a, a safe area to explore options that in a sense there is no safe area to explore options because the devil's not going to give you any any room to explore options that's not what his business is and god will give you plenty of room to explore options he already has and we need to imitate him but exploring options doesn't mean that if you finally come down with a certain option that it doesn't entail some consequences. And one of the consequences is it means that I may not want to give you money that I might otherwise to teach my kid or to teach other people's kids my religion. And that is an inevitable result. And I don't see that that can ever be taken out of the equation because as soon as you start saying that you have complete academic freedom, you can do whatever you want to, um, maybe with the limitations of you can't uh, break the law. Um, but if you try to make a complete, a complete academic freedom, then that means that you take away the freedom of people to accept your particular brand of uh, education. And I don't think that's right either. We're entitled to draw conclusions. We are. We have a comment down here. Uh, on the subject of freedom, um, there was perfect freedom in heaven before there was any sin. And Ellen White says, Satan uh, abused that freedom. It became license. I think we need to draw a distinction. There's, you know, our academic freedom doesn't mean uh, just whatever, anything goes. That's not true freedom, anyway. That's not the freedom God has 
ordained for us. Actually, it is the freedom that God will. That anything God goes? God allowed the freedom to abuse that freedom. But that's not freedom. Uh, I didn't say that it doesn't even end in slavery in the end. You know, okay. we were offered well, the tree of life. You're saying that you said that is freedom. That isn't freedom. That's license. Well, we're only free to obey God's laws because that's the only way we're going to be free. I know that's circular uh, I reasoning. Mean, that's that's the thing. In in the end, certain kinds of freedom are destructive. And God will allow us to do that. You can call it freedom, but, but I don't call it freedom. But it eventually, it eventually is destructive, and that's what this whole experiment is about. Is, and the interesting thing of it is, God still sends the rain on the unjust, in spite of the fact that He knows that they're going to use it to, um, uh, you know, grow crops that are poisonous, for example. Uh, that's the kind of a God he is. He does support the uh, freedom of choice. The freedom of choice. But also when people do choose, they, they are not free to choose whatever they want. And the devil was not free eventually to choose whatever he wanted. What it turned out was that when you choose to abuse freedom, it does get eventually taken away. Uh, I think you take it away. I think that's the natural consequences of those kinds of choices, uh, and Bi God allows them to happen. The Bible speaks of uh, they've laid their they've laid a trap and they fall into it themselves. That's right. That's what will happen. And Satan fell into his own trap without God having to help him. He didn't. He surely didn't help him. But even the secular scientific community has put restraints on academic freedom. Certainly in the institutions I was in Europe, you could not do research, even if you didn't ask for funding, unless you had ethics clearance. Otherwise, you go back to the pre-World War II type of research. So if the secular society, scientific society, places restraints on the so-called free um, demonstration of academic freedom, certainly a Christian organization has equal rights. Well, like I say, I think that they do. And I think, that the, I think that the cure for this is open sunlight and then allow people to do what they want to, including the church. And if the church decides it doesn't want to fund this, then La is going to have to either find some other force of, source of funding or fold. It's that simple. But we need honesty. And I think that people who, people who cry about academic freedom but are not honest. I would, what I would love to do is I would love to have some kind of a panel where these guys can s say what they want to say in public, recorded. On their own. <laughs> That's um, if they far. want to, as professor of biology or theology at La Sierra, uh, they, can, they can drag whatever authority they want to in with them. But, you know, and if in the end people decide that's not what I want my kid to do and uh, enrollment from certain areas of La Sierra drops, then that's what happens. It's only fair. But that's, that's just my take on it. Can I move to uh, a different topic? It's on the lesson, though. Monday, we talked about a fallen world. I was surprised that that was interjected again into the flow of thought, but I can see a logic for it because we spent, last week, we spent a whole week on the fall, creation in the fall. And I was working on last week's lesson this morning, thinking about the fall and what is the curse? The Bible makes it very clear, and Ellen White does too, that there are two distinct curses at least. And you might throw in a third one with the ground cursed again at the time of uh, Cain and Abel, the murder of uh, Abel. But there are two very distinct curses, and I always call them worldwide curses until I got to thinking, 
what was cursed? Uh, was the earth cursed or was the ground cursed? <laughs> I know that's a fine distinction, but I looked up in the Hebrew and it's Adama, the ground was cursed. And I thought, can we extend that to the whole earth, the whole planet being cursed, including the atmosphere and the oceans and the depths and everything? Uh, and if I, you curse the ground, doesn't it have effects on the uh, oceans? And let me finish. Let me finish. <laughs> you can see where I'm going with this. Um, the ground is where the bulk of the curse was, right? And the creatures of the ground. And if you look at all the references, like I did this morning, of the word Adama. Nowhere does it imply, imply that it covers the whole shebang. It's the soil, it's the ground, it's the animals on the ground, it's the fruit that comes out of the ground, and so on. Now this has important implications for an argument that our fellow creationists uh, use quite a bit in their websites, and that's that there could not be any uh, death before sin. And we've debated that here, and I know. I can see Dr. Roth <laughs> reacting immediately. Uh, if it's the ground that was cursed and the terrestrial environment received the bulk of the curse, I agree it could spill over a little bit in the oceans. The ocean life has a very delicate balance, and Ardo will agree with me. When you look at coral reefs, they're starting to die out. And just the parameters for a reef to survive are very narrow. I got to thinking about coral. Did God make coral so that it would live for everlasting life? Or did he make coral so that it would be recycled, 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 and you could have a reef build up even in a perfect environment? If he made coral that it could be recycled and these little polyps could die off, then you could have some death before sin. That's just a, a thought that I reached this morning. I'm still working on that topic. Uh, one thought that I'd throw in since you raised this question is, uh, yes, and uh, uh, I'd extend the curse if you're going to use that argument, probably beyond the land. Uh, as some interpret it now, I, I tend to not completely agree with this argument, but uh, you know, whales have this tremendous baleen, baleen whales, uh, which is designed to trap krill, uh, which is their source of food. Now, uh, if you're going to say there's no death before, what did the whales eat? What did they use their baleen for, uh, and how did they survive? Uh, to complicate the picture a little bit, I, I'm not comfortable with saying there was no death before. So how did the elephants keep from walking on the ants in the Garden of Eden? That's one argument. And what do you do about the Venus flytrap? What do you do about the uh, web of the spider that traps other insects and so on? Uh, so, uh, just throw in, I, I think we need to raise uh, the bar on uh, what we call death before sin to, to, to a higher level of, um, of organism and so on. But, uh, so, I, I just thought I'd throw that in. Uh, coral reefs recycling, I can, live with, uh, I can live with that model. I just thought of that. Yeah. <laughs> Because uh, obviously, obviously you got death there when a, a coral reef grows. It, it grows on the previous right. organisms. As they, it keeps on growing. Uh, you'd have to, I mean, it, it, and when Adam ate an apple, he, look at all those cells he killed in that apple. Oh. Um. Thank you. <laughs> Plant life doesn't seem to, uh, to bother. I don't think it bothers people as much. Um, yeah. 
Well, if the whole premise of all of our theology is based on the fact that we have free will, otherwise we couldn't have a fall, we couldn't have a devil, we couldn't have a lot of things, then I would argue that the possibility for death had to exist prior to the fall. And the reason is, if, I, if you have a beings that are living in a perfect environment, you ha in order to exercise free will, you have to have something to choose between. If I, for instance, over in communist Russia, they used to have a, they used to vote, you were able to, they would send out the ballot which had the official party member who was, who had been um, officially put up for the post, and then underneath you were able to write in a name if you wished to vote for somebody else. They would then, if someone, poor soul, did that, they would then analyze the handwriting, find out who it was, and ship them off to Siberia, where they died. Now, is that democracy? No. You can't have, there is no free choice there to vote. If you wrote something down, what you really wanted to do was commit suicide. Because your vote would have no chance of meaning anything whatsoever other than sending you to Siberia. So, if God's going to have free will in heaven, there has to be something or some things upon which the creatures have a choice. If you have no free, if you have nothing to choose between, it doesn't matter if you have free will. The results is the same. So therefore, in heaven, I used to wonder why God would put in a tree of life. It appears that the animals, we don't know, but the, it, the Bible gives us no clue that the animals have a grass of life or a vegetable of life that they need to eat. It, it appears uh, it, it's silence on that on that topic, but you know, the suggestion is, if, if I read it, is they probably don't. That the human beings are the ones that gather at the tree of life. In Revelation 21, uh, says that the leaves are uh, for the healing of the nations, and the and the fruit comes every month. So, in order for God, the ultimate question that God's creatures would have the question the, the ultimate question from which all other questions arise is do you want to live in this environment all right if you don't have that uh, option it doesn't matter if you have some options as to whether you want to eat an apple or a pear today those are insignificant in compared to the um, option of whether you wish to continue on that's the ultimate um, bedrock foundation from which all other free will would have to spring. So God gave the uh, option in the tree of life, if you chose not to go forward, all you had to do is not eat it. So there is a choice there. You, you are not constrained to go uh, as a prisoner on for eternity if you don't like what God has created. There's a way out. Just don't eat the fruit. And I believe that that is mandatory. If you're going to have free will, you have to have that option first and foremost, and then the others are additive, if you will. I'm a little nervous about having the, uh, the animals, particularly the higher animals, not having access to a tree of life and therefore dying out. Um, no, I'm saying they don't. I'm saying the animals don't require that. You mean they don't need it? At yeah, the that's end. right. They because they don't—they anyway. don't have the free will option that we do. The creature yeah. that has the free will option has the tree of life. The rest of them don't. They're, they're so you're not going to have Fido live for 20 years and then die. No. no. So otherwise, you're killing puppies. You realize? Yeah. No, I—I—I I, I, I must have <laughs> presented it wrong. No, the whole idea is, if you have the ability to free choice, then you're going to have the equivalent of the tree of life. If you don't, you won't. You're, yeah. you're going to be, you're, you're on the ride forever. But, but the idea is that people will still have the option for self uh, disappearance, shall we say, if they want. They, all they have to do is starve themselves of, of life tree fruit and um, that'll take care of it. an interesting take.
Well, next week we're going to talk about Jesus' provider and sustainer. I may throw in some other stuff as well. We'll see what happens.